Okay. Um, so this is going to be a, a set of four lectures on, as the title indicates, uh, sort of uh, an introduction uh, to perturbation uh, methods. And, and, and really, it's introduction to perturbation methods for differential equations. Okay, so um, you can do perturbation methods for different kinds of things, but my main emphasis will be to talk about nonlinear uh, differential equations. Um, so as I said, it's going to be four lectures. I have a rough idea that the first two lectures will be sort of generic, uh, simple examples, and maybe the last two lectures I'll take specific examples from applications in different areas of physics and sort of show you how the calculations go. Uh, some of you who attended uh, my talk in the Bay of Bengal uh, uh, discussion meeting that happened recently, I might do a recap of that same example uh, with more detail as well. Um, okay. Um, also, the intended audience is for someone who is not a mathematician, so let me already apologize to everyone who is mathematically inclined, no proofs, um, nothing uh, is going to be done in a rigorous fashion. But I do want to hint at uh, certain mathematical ideas that will be useful uh, just to do the calculations itself. So I want to hint that uh, some things have a systematic way of doing it, uh, even though I won't necessarily prove any of these results. Um, the other thing, uh, okay, so maybe the, the most important thing. Uh, feel free not to take notes uh, because uh, I have written up the notes. Um, just pay attention. So if you go to uh, my page, uh, at the bottom, uh, there's this set of notes that I'll be working out of. Uh, I really want more people to ask questions uh, right now uh, rather than uh, later. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for the second, third, and fourth, uh, lecture. I'm happy to be here half an hour before the lecture starts in case people have questions and people want to discuss, and then the lecture can start at 11. Okay? Um, so you'll find basically a PDF uh, with that title, Introduction to Perturbation Methods. Um, I won't be covering everything that I've written in the notes because it's just four lectures and I've written far more. Uh, so some things will be skipped and I'll just mention that, read that in the notes and then we can talk about it uh, the next time. Uh, okay. Um, what else did I want to say? So, right, so we're, 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 it's definitely going to be a non-rigorous uh, thing. And what's the goal? The goal is to uh, understand um, sort of how we obtain approximate solutions to uh, differential e equations, uh, typically nonlinear. Right, so a nonlinear differential equation is hard for a whole host of reasons, and so maybe you know you just want to do a numerical method and solve it. Fine, that's all well and good, but how do you know you don't have a bug in your code? You need to compare it with a base solution. Maybe you're lucky and that your nonlinear equation has a special class of solutions that you can compare it to. Well and good. What do you do when it doesn't? Uh, you'd like to have something to benchmark against. Now, of course, what we will do is obtain approximate solutions and not exact solutions, because if we could obtain exact solutions, why would you be doing the numerical method? So they will be necessarily approximate solutions. Uh, the other reason why this is, uh, uh, this is the word approximate is in quotes is, A, I'm not going to prove they are approximate solutions. I'm just going to show you the systematic way of getting those expressions. Um, proving them is a whole separate lecture and produces all kinds of difficulties. Um, but it's also the word uh, 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 approximate um, in, in, in the sense that, you know, there's almost, 
it's, it's very hard to even guarantee that these approximations will be good. So if you've heard of the phrase divergent series, that's sort of what we'll be dealing with. So in what sense do they model the phenomenon? In a very qualitative sense. When I come to applications, I can talk more about in what sense for that application. But it is in a very qualitative sense, and understanding how the expression we have matches with reality or an experiment is a whole different ballgame. And, and I'll talk about that in the context of an example. So first, I'll just show you what this general idea is. Then we can go to specific examples and see in that context Maybe I can pull up some data or some experiment and show some qualitative analysis. Okay? Um, so, so it's approximate in, in, in two dual senses. Um, okay. So every equation we study will be of the form LQ plus epsilon NQ is zero. So Q is some you know, state variable describes the, the state of your system. L is a linear operator. Uh, N is a nonlinear operator. And uh, epsilon is a small parameter. Which parameter depends on the context? Right, so epsilon may or may not have a physical meaning. As far as I'm concerned, uh, at this level, uh, I'm completely disregarding that. And the goal is to solve uh, such an equation. Okay, so you'd like to find these Qs that satisfy this system of equations. Q need not be a scalar. It could be a vector. Q need not be uh, just a function of time, it could be a function of space and time, it could be a, a function of multiple variables, I, I don't care. Uh, in some sense it will matter, but in some senses there's a broader theme going on for equations of this form. Okay? And uh, a very good question is, how small is small? Right, so. What does small mean? And that's tied to how approximate is approximate. That should make sense, right? So in what sense am I trying to make these things? Typically, it will be true in the limit of epsilon vanishingly small. And the smaller epsilon is, the better the approximation. Okay? Um, and what we will do is the usual approach as suggested by the title perturbation methods, is to expand Q in an epsilon series. Let's say epsilon squared Q. Right. So that's the goal. And you can think about it as trying to find a solution to this problem that's a power series in epsilon. And of course, when you see power series, you should at some point ask yourself, is the series convergent, and that's exactly what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to prove the convergence of this series in epsilon. Uh, quite often, these are not power series, these are asymptotic series, which is to say they don't converge if you add an infinite number of terms, but for fixed epsilon, so sorry, for fixed number of terms, epsilon going to zero, it can be a good approximation. Okay? So quite often, we will not even write down this guy. <laughs> we'll actually just stop with this. Epsilon is a scalar. Yes, yes, yes. So epsilon is a scalar. In fact, you know, a lot of fluids problems will come with, you know, f two, four, five, ten different parameters. And quite often what I will do is I'll be interested in a regime where the parameters scale in a certain way on a on another parameter. So there's fundamentally only one parameter, and I'm interested in some ray in parameter space. So I'll go along some specific direction. Um, which direction you go and how you relate multiple parameters to one parameter is a problem of physics, 
And then I'll claim I'm a mathematician and I'm not going to answer that question and say, okay, that, that, that's, that's whatever you're interested in. However, the way we do it, it won't matter how epsilon was obtained. So you could ask another parameter regime, follow a different ray, and everything I say will still hold. So, so long as there is a small parameter, you're good to go. It doesn't have to be a specific small parameter. You can define what it is you want. In different directions in parameter space, you will have different behaviors. And that's part of what I want to show, is that that naturally sort of comes about where the, where the different behaviors arise from. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, so I'm going to typically take uh, something like, you know, n of q to be order q squared. Something like that. Now this is, I haven't told you what q is, so you, you may have to understand this as a norm uh, quantity, uh, q norm squared. Uh, but basically, uh, n is not homogeneous of order 1, which is what L would be. Right? So that's the more important thing, that this is definitely little o of q. So it's, 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 uh, you know, it's higher order than q, but I don't know what it is. So it's what you would call a genuine nonlinearity. There's no linear part to the nonlinearity. <laughs> Again, I will violate that in one of my examples, and I'll actually have a linear term as well. But more importantly, the question is, uh, how does it scale with, uh, with an epsilon in front? So the more important thing is, these things don't have an epsilon, this has an epsilon. So I'll, I'll come to that when I do the exact example. But for now, just assume that n is a nonlinearity. There is no assumption, but I, should, I would want it. <laughs> I would want the, the, the solution to this problem to, have, to be unique. Uh, if it is not unique, and I will consider such examples, I'll then find conditions so that I get back to some notion of uniqueness. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, so this could be a system of nonlinear equations. Nonlinear PDEs. Yes. What are the? Uh, zero, one, and two. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, if something is not visible to the people at the back, just tell me and I'll write bigger or I'll point you to the page in the notes. And then you can also do that. So, all right. Um, okay. Just a, a notion. This is also called the method of multiple scales. The notes calls it formal methods. Um, and, 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 and there are all kinds of other uh, sort of not very uh, uh, complementary names. I mean, uh, sometimes it's black magic. Um, you know, uh, the dark arts. Um, so when, when, when I learned this stuff, it was definitely shown to be sort of like voodoo and magic, like why does this work? And my goal is to sort of demystify this bit. It's actually not black magic. There's a standard way to do it. But if you read the literature, either in the physics literature or in the applied math literature, it'll certainly come across as black magic. Like why should any of this work? Um, all right. Of course, I won't answer why it works. I'll still sort of just suggest why it works. Uh, the dark arts, because again, you, uh, this goes back to the, the, the comment by Hardy about divergent series, um, that you know, they're the work of the devil. You really shouldn't trust them. And these are divergent series. There is the work of the devil, but you know, sometimes paying a price in, in, the, in your soul is maybe worth it. Huh? You shouldn't do it all the time, but maybe sometimes you get something, something for it. Huh? OK. Um, Let's begin with a sort of tangential discussion on linear equations. The phrase tangential discussion is a pun, but uh, maybe you'll understand why later on. 
Um, okay. Uh, you've all probably seen linear equations of uh, the form. Well, okay, let's, let's start with something very simple. X is a scalar. Okay? How do you, you, th this is probably something you did in like sixth standard or something. Right? Um, we can clearly solve this. X is 5 minus 4 by 3. And that's as far as I'll go on the board. I'm not going to do any more calculations because I will get it wrong. Right? So we can solve for x. We can solve for x uniquely. OK? This is case 1. Zero times x plus four should be five. Can we solve for x? How many people think we can still solve for x? Can you suggest one value of x such that this statement is true? No. Okay. So there's no solution since, by most accounts, four is not equal to five. Right? Okay. 0 times x, 0. How many values of x work here? An infinite number. OK, very good. So infinite number of solutions. So if you, I mean, this is something that they don't actually do in 6th standard. They probably should do in 6th standard and show you that there are three possibilities that you can get. A unique solution, no solution, and an infinite number of solutions. Right, so, um, now let's consider, let's go back to case two. Um, I can write this as 0x equals 1. Okay. What's the difference between this expression and that expression is purely what's on the right hand side. Okay. So, both of them have the same left hand side. And it's the right-hand side that tells us whether we have no solution or an infinite number of solutions. Okay? And how could we go, or what is a procedure to, uh, to start with this expression and to go to this expression? Multiply the right-hand side by zero. Then you will get this. Okay? So I can go from here to here by multiplying the right-hand side by a suitable quantity. Okay? Does everyone understand this logic? It may seem very obvious. Okay? Don't worry, I will make it very non-obvious very quickly. This is sort of how I teach. I teach something very, very obvious, and then I quickly make it non-obvious. Okay? But the logic is that there is a procedure that you have to apply to the right-hand side to make sure you can generate some solutions. Of course, we generate an infinite number of solutions. That's certainly some solutions. It's a lot of solutions. We'll deal with the problem of which of these infinite solutions to be interested in later on. So this goes back to the comment uh, Saranj made that would I have non-uniqueness. Yes, I haven't finished. I'll do some more things to make it a unique solution. OK? All right. So let's make life more interesting. And let's consider a system of equations. A, x equals b. Now here, a is uh, a matrix, so something that's in Rn cross Rn, x and b are vectors in Rn. Okay? I'll usually deal with square matrices um, for the most part. Okay, so 
hopefully many of you have seen this at some point, if determinant of A is not zero, then the solution is X is A inverse B, and the solution is unique. Okay? This is exactly analogous to case one. So three is the matrix, and its determinant here is three, and so I can divide by three, and I can define the inverse. Okay? So this is case one. Uh, we'll be interested in case two. What if determinant of A is zero? And I want to sort of suggest that there are two possibilities. I may have no solution, I may have an infinite number of solutions, and the only thing that it depends on is the right-hand side. I have to pick the right vector E to distinguish between these two possible cases. So if B is not the appropriate quantity, there may be no solution. When B is the appropriate quantity, there will be an infinite number of solutions. Okay? All right, so. The side tangent. Um, so let's define the span of A or you may think of it as the range of A, is all vectors of the form alpha i vi sum over i going from 1 to n, where vi are the columns of A, and alpha are just scalars, right? Okay, so then the, once you un, uh, have this sort of uh, uh, an object, there's a nice way to interpret what matrix vector multiplication is. Multiplying a matrix by a particular vector is equivalent to setting particular alphas and taking a linear combination of the columns. Is everyone okay with that idea? Matrix vector multiplication is just the sum of the columns of the matrix, scaled by some numbers. And in this case, it would be the elements of X. Okay. Now, a solution exists if B is in the span of A. Okay? So, what I mean is you are asking for what combination of the columns of the matrix produces a given vector. Well, if the vector is not even in the set of all possible combinations, how can you even solve that problem? So if B doesn't belong to the span of A, that means B, doesn't, B cannot be written as a linear combination of the vectors, and hence, how could I find out what linear combination of the vectors to choose? And that's exactly what's going on here. In this case, 0 times, four, uh, zero times x produces the number 0 always. So the only thing you can set it equal to is 0. If you set it equal to something that's outside of 0, you can't solve the equation. Okay? For systems, that's a little more complicated, and it's not as simple as just multiplying by zero. But morally speaking, multiplying by zero is exactly what this determinant A equals zero condition is kind of simulating. Okay? So, let me consider AX equals B with determinant of A is zero. Okay? Since 
determinant of a is zero, then there is a vector y such that a y is zero and y is non-zero. That's what it actually means for the determinant of a matrix to be zero. There's a zero eigenvector. That's what y is. Okay? So, multiply ax equals b on both sides by y, which is to say, consider this object. This is a scalar equality. Okay? You can read this as Ay transpose x is y transpose b, which then implies y transpose b is zero for all y such that Ay is zero. Okay? So, coming back to my comment that I had to multiply the right-hand side by a suitable quantity to go from the expression where the right-hand side is in the wrong set of vectors to the right set of vectors. It's dictated by... Um, sorry, I'm missing some transpose here. There we go. There we go. For all... It's correct in the notes. It's wrong on the board. This is also why I write notes. So, I mean, I can just say read the notes. Huh? Okay, so the condition that needs to be satisfied is this, that the right-hand side should be perpendicular to a set of vectors. Which vectors? The vectors that are in the null space of the transpose. So if you want to solve Ax equals b, and A has zero uh, determinant, a transpose has zero determinant, and hence A transpose y equals zero for a non-zero y, and then B has to be perpendicular to that y. Okay? So let's go back to our example. Our matrix is zero. The transpose of the scalar matrix zero is zero. What number times zero is zero? Well, any number, but they're all multiples of one. So then I need 1 times 1 to be 0. And that's, so so I, I have to sort of eliminate that possibility. So I have to get rid of this. Right? And that's sort of what this condition is telling me. I'll do, I'll do an example with an actual matrix, so it's, it's more obvious what's going on. But I kind of wanted to suggest that everything we see is already there uh, in, in sort of first-order stuff. So let me just state the one theorem that I will use is the Fred Holm alternative. To solve Ax equals b, either determinant of A is non-zero, then A inverse b is the unique solution, or, and there's the alternative, the equation can only be solved for those vectors b such that y transpose b is 0 for all a transpose y is 0. Okay? Oh. <laughs> In such a case, the solution is not unique. Okay? So this is the Fred Holm alternative, and there's your alternative. Either your matrix is invertible or your matrix is not invertible. If it's not invertible, you have to make sure you're asking the right question. Okay? 
And uh, as far as I'm concerned for the rest of these lectures, that's the most important theorem that I will continue to use. But I won't just be using it in the case of matrices. I'll also be using it in the case of differential operators, partial differential operators, systems of partial differential operators. But the logic is always the same. In order to solve a, uh, a linear equation, if A is an operator, you have to have a suitable notion of a transpose. Then you have to have a suitable notion of elements in the null space of the transpose. Then you need to impose the condition of an orthogonality with respect to elements in the null space of the transpose. So whereas in vectors, it's just going to be like a dot product for um, functions, I'm going to use the inner product of the L2 space. Okay? And then for systems of functions, I'll combine both. I'll have a dot product over the elements and an inner product over the functions. Okay? And then quite often, after a while, you sort of see the logic. You can sort of see, how huh, this should be perpendicular to that. I shouldn't have this. I shouldn't have that. And that's usually how this stuff is written in, in a paper. <laughs> they just sort of say, huh, that thing over there needs to go away. And this is the condition. And so then this is what the equation is. And my job is to sort of show you the steps and hopefully bring you to a point where y even you start writing papers like that. So we're not going to change the universe. Right? We're going to continue doing bad things. Uh, but at least you'll know why you're doing it. Uh, that's good enough for me. OK. So let's start off with an actual example where perturbation methods is needed. Um, one thing I should probably mention, that was a discussion on linear equations, and I'm interested in nonlinear equations, and the logic to go from nonlinear to linear is to linearize, and hence this phrase, perturbation methods. When we expand in epsilon, we'll end up with a sequence of linear problems, and then I'll only have to solve AX equals B type equations, and so then I'll, I can start invoking the Fredholm alternative. Okay. Um, those of you who are familiar with the implicit function theorem, this is literally what the implicit function theorem does, but in a rigorous fashion. Those of you who are familiar with Newton's method, this is literally what Newton's method does, but in a numerical fashion. Right? And so we are going to do paper-pencil versions of, numer of Newton's method and the implicit function theorem in contexts where Newton's method and the implicit function theorem may or may not hold. But we could still do the calculation. Okay. All right, so uh, this is an algebraic example. Just to get our feet wet, and before I jump into differential equations, let me consider. Sure, I can. One, two. Two, one, x one, x two, plus x two squared, plus x one, x two, x one squared, x one, x two, zero, zero. Okay, so. Claim number one, this is an equation of the above form. Yes? Because to go from here to here, I need to have an extra transpose. Right? So if I expand this transpose out, I'll get y transpose, a transpose, transpose. So that's important. It seems like a sort of technical issue, but if you start working with problems that are not self-adjoint, then this is an incredibly important issue, because then you have the wrong null space. Right? So it's the vector that's important. The eigenvalues are exactly the same, but the eigenvectors need not. And then you're going to get the wrong orthogonality condition, which is to say you'll get the wrong coefficients in your reduced order model, and then you will claim the experimentalist has made a mistake. Right? So to prevent that, that transpose is important. <laughs> yeah. That 
That's right. So this condition is a scalar condition, but for each y. So suppose the uh, A transpose has a null space of dimension 4, then there are four linearly independent y vectors, and then I'll get four equations. So this is important. The only way I will get a system of equations is if I have higher dimensional null spaces. If my null space is only one dimensional, then I'll only have one equation. Another way to say it is, if only one eigenvalue is zero, then there's only one compatibility condition. Because each eigenvalue has at least a separate eigenvector, and if only one of them is zero, then there's only one zero eigenvector. How can I get multiple eigenvectors? I need to have multiple zeros. So the zero eigenvalue must be at least of second order, third order, fourth order. Then I can start introducing more eigenvectors. Since you've brought up the point, I then have to start distinguish, uh, distinguishing between uh, algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity. Do I have a separate eigenvector for uh, all the repeated eigenvalues, or do I have generalized eigenvectors? So because it's a non self joint problem in general, those are all issues that may or may not arise. Uh, as it happens, every example I deal with in the notes is actually a self joint operator. So it won't, uh, uh, that won't be an issue. The one example that I want to discuss where it's uh, non self joint is actually an example I haven't finished writing up yet, uh, but by two lectures later on, there will be an example which is a, a non self joint operator. So as you can see here, self joint. <laughs> Again, why? Uh, in all textbooks, we'll discuss self joint operators because the author is lazy and doesn't want to construct what the eigenvectors are for the other, uh, for the transpose. And he's like, I'm lazy, I'll just do this, and then tell you it all works out. Okay? So, I'll, again, continue with the tradition, only mention that it's wrong. And hopefully one of you will write a better book. All right, so first things first, this is an equation of the following form. Here's my linear operator my state variable, and this is my nonlinear operator. Your first question should be, where's epsilon? So what we'll do is rescale. x1, x2, epsilon, x1, x2. And since this is a quadratic nonlinearity, I'll get an epsilon squared, I'll get an epsilon, I'll cancel one epsilon, and then I can put an epsilon there, right? So now, of course, uh, this is a video, so you saw how this happened. <laughs> so I, I don't have to explain that the rescale happened after I wrote the equation without the epsilon. Okay, very good. All right, okay. So this is our equation that we want to solve. Uh, we want to find out what x1 and x2 are, and as I said, we are going to take an expansion, x1, x2, x1, 0, x2, 0, plus epsilon, x1, 1, x2, 1, plus order epsilon squared. Since we want to expand in powers of epsilon, we're going to start comparing at each order. So the order one equation will be 1, 2, 2, 1, x1, 0, x2, 0. Should equal 0, 0. Right? Sorry? Uh, 1 refers to... Uh, yeah, I'm off by, uh, it's the order one, I didn't say the uh, power of epsilon, but that's the way I write it, the constant term. Um, yeah, so that's another thing, different papers will use, they'll be off by one. This is kind of like Fortran and C, should you start at zero, should you start at one? Again, not going to change the world, but this is, this is what we have. All right, so this is uh, the case where the determinant is non-zero. 
leave for you to check that that's actually true. Um, hence, x10, x20 is 1, 2, 2, 1, inverse 0, 0, which is 0, 0. Great. Very easy to solve. So we've got our lowest order term. We proceed at order epsilon. One, two, two, one, x one, one, x two, one, plus x two, zero squared, x one, x two, zero, zero, x one, zero squared, x one, x two, zero, 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 zero. So how do you get the order epsilon terms? You go to your equation and you want everything that has at least one epsilon up front. That means from the x1, x2, I'm going to get the first order correction. These are all being multiplied one by one epsilon already, and so everything has to be at order zero. Using the fact that I know what the zeroth order is, I end up with this. And so the connection is also 0, 0. Very good. It's obvious. That's my point. We'll make it non-obvious in just a little while later. But hopefully you can see what's going to happen if I go to the next order. I'm not going to write that down, but if I go to the next order, I'm going to get contributions from here that have upfront epsilon squared, I've already got one epsilon, so I should have upfront epsilons, which means I have to evaluate it at the correction, which is zero, so then all of this is going to go away at order epsilon squared as well. And so I'm going to get 1, 2, 2, 1, x1, 2, x2, 2 equals 0, 0. So the next order term is also zero. And then you can start, sort of see where this is going to go, that each term is going to be 0. Why is each term 0? Because the equation is the same operator times the thing you don't know written in terms of things you already know. Because you've got this epsilon, this term is always retarded in epsilon. It's one order less. So I would have already solved for this nonlinear term when I'm trying to find the new correction. This is why we do perturbation methods, right? Because it sort of splits the problem into a linear equation with a right-hand side that's known in terms of lower-order stuff. That's why iteration works in Newton's method also, because the right-hand side is known, and you sort of repeatedly iterate. So there's an iteration algorithm going on, but in epsilons. Okay. So with that, it shouldn't be too far-fetched to claim for all epsilon, right? So no matter how many uh, terms I get, I'll always end up with this same equation. And this matrix is invertible, and so I'll always get 0, 0. So this is to really belabor the point, which is, perturbation methods are only interesting when the matrices are non-invertible. Because when it's invertible, you're just going to get a sequence like this. Okay? It's not too hard to see that the original problem itself you can immediately just plug in x1 and x2 as 0, and you can get a solution. I've written the word a solution as opposed to the word the solution, which is a question of uniqueness. And that's where the fact that since this matrix is, all, is invertible, you have no other option. You're always going to get this solution. There's nothing else you can do. 
So the issue of non-uniqueness for the matrix is what gives us non-trivial solutions for this problem. Right? So we will be specifically interested in the case when the linear operator L is non-invertible. Because if it's invertible, we can just repeat this argument. And a rigorous version of this argument is literally the implicit function theorem, which says the only solution to this problem in the neighborhood of 0, 0 is 0, 0 for all epsilon. So you will then expand in powers of root epsilon. So you shouldn't, you'll still have then an order one term. There's no root epsilon. It doesn't matter. I mean, this is the thing that all you've done is replaced epsilon by root epsilon. That's, that's, lit that's literally all. So one way to think about it, and this is useful, which is in what power of epsilon should you expand? Typically, the answer is what power of epsilon appears in the problem. There are interesting problems where in which, uh, even though epsilon appears, you have expansions in root epsilon and epsilon to the one-third and epsilon to the one over n. Uh, a physical example is flow over a wall. So viscous flow over a wall forms a boundary layer, and if you start including higher-order corrections, that is to say you want to find a solution to full Navier-Stokes by this asymptotics method, you will start getting nested boundary layers of different thicknesses, where epsilon now is like 1 over Reynolds number. But the key thing there is there's something funny going on with the operator itself that would have told you there's something funny going on and we need to do some other things. Um, those are usually classed as singular perturbation problems, and I depending on how much time I have, I may or may not be able to talk about those things. Um, for the most part, I'll be talking about what's called regular perturbation, uh, except in certain instances, some singular perturbation problems can be cast as regular perturbation problems of the method of multiple scales. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a non-trivial overlap in terms of concept. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. So you will always have the situation that the nonlinear contribution will be in terms of lower order stuff. Even whether the operator is invertible or not, that's effectively an algebraic issue, that you are expanding in a power series of epsilon, and your problem already has an epsilon. So then these two cannot be of the same order. So this must be one order less than this. Yeah. Yes? For a what? For an inhomogeneous problem, we cannot do that. That's correct. I agree. Yeah, but I can always change the zero. I can shift stuff. Uh, I can, I mean, if it's a problem in a vector space, let me push the zero, the origin, to that point. You'll, you'll grant that I can always do that. Right? So suppose I had a right hand side. Let me shift in x and then choose the appropriate shift to knock out that term. So, still have tricks up my sleeve. Those short sleeves. Yeah, yeah. If it's not, what would you do? You change L. If, if, if N has a linear operator, put that into L. More tricks. Any other questions? Are you considering the case when it's a non-invertible matrix? Yes. What do you mean by base solution? Sorry, say, 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 say that again? What do you mean by base solution? I don't understand that word. This one, lowest order term, okay? How many solutions to this problem are there? I, I can't have any other base solution because this is an invertible matrix. The only solution to this problem is zero, zero. And, and so, as, as I hinted at, you can prove a theorem in this context and show that not only does the series in epsilon converge, 
but it's the only solution to the problem in any neighborhood that contains zero zero. The only solution to this problem is zero zero. So there's an open neighborhood of zero zero vector where this is the only solution. You need to go to a point where the linearization of this equation fails to be invertible. So take x1, x2 at some other point, linearize this expression about that point so that some contribution from this expression goes into the linear operator, making the linear operator deficient and have a zero eigenvalue. In the parlance of dynamical systems, that point is called a bifurcation point. So, unless you, uh, so long as you're away from bifurcation points, uh, implicit function theorem holds. And there's only one solution, a regular expansion won't give you anything interesting. So we will typically then be interested in those operators or those equations whose, yeah, the equation is such that the origin is a possible bifurcation point. Because the linearization about the origin itself will be deficient. Okay? All that is to say, I want the matrix to be non-invertible. I want zero eigenvalues. Only then is this interesting. Okay, so then let's make this uh, precisely that. Let's do an example where we have a deficient matrix. Yet another example. One, one, two, two. X1, X2 plus epsilon x2 squared plus x1, x2 plus 3, x1, x1 squared plus x1, x2 plus 6, x2 uh, equals 0, 0. So I've changed my problem. My linear operator is different. My nonlinear operator is different. My nonlinear operator seems to have a linear term, but it's being multiplied by an epsilon. So in any epsilon expansion, that's a lower order term. Okay. So once again, we take an expansion, and we consider the order one e equation. One, two, one, two. X one, zero. X two, zero. Should be... 0, 0. Now this is a non-invertible matrix. Yes? Uh, I'm stating that problem. That is my problem. Okay. I, I, I could rescale it, but I already have an epsilon. The only reason I rescaled this problem was to show you if your problem doesn't have an epsilon, there's an option to rescale to introduce an epsilon. But if your problem has an epsilon, then just do that. Okay. All right. So, what's the solution in this case? Well, there are non-trivial solutions that look like alpha times 2 minus 1, where alpha is a scalar. So I have a one-dimensional null space. One zero eigenvalue, one non-zero eigenvalue. The non-zero uh, eigenvalue has an eigenvector 1, 1. Because the operator is always projecting onto the direction of 1, 1. Because if you look at the columns, they're 1, 1 and 2, 2. So you're going to take linear combinations of 1, 1 and 2, 2, which will be something times 1, 1. So the output is always along 1, 1. At this stage, this is an important comment, alpha is undetermined. Undetermined. Every alpha works. Right? Yeah. This is asking what's the zero eigenvector of this matrix, and it turns out that's the zero eigenvector. Another way to see it, take this vector, multiply it by this matrix, you get zero. 
Okay. All right. So this leads to our next expression for the correction, which is So when I want everything of order epsilon, these guys should all be zeroth order terms. And I know what x10 and x20 are. They're just 2 alpha and minus alpha. So I can plug in 2 alpha and minus alpha there. And I'll just write down what the expression is. Minus alpha squared plus 6 alpha, 2 alpha squared minus 6 alpha. Everyone okay with that? All right. So now we have exp uh, exactly of a form matrix times an unknown vector should equal a vector, but the matrix has a null space. Right? It has the uh, null space 2 minus 1. Right? So this is literally of the form AX equals B with determinant of A 0. Yes? We're all good on that. This one? This is minus alpha squared, no? So, so this gives me an alpha squared. And then here I get negative 2 alpha squared. I get minus alpha squared. Note. We don't know what alpha is. Alpha could be any number. This is, at this level, this is true for every alpha. OK? But to solve this system for the correction, the Fred Holm alternative imposes a condition. Right? So although this expression at this level is true for every alpha, if you actually want to get a correction, B has to be perpendicular to Y, where Y is the null space of the transpose. So this is the vector B, and it has to be perpendicular to the null space of the transpose of this matrix. So 1, 2, 1, 2. OK? So that suggests minus alpha squared plus 6 alpha, 2 alpha squared minus 6 alpha should be orthogonal to the null space of 1, 2, 1, 2. What's the null space of 1, 2, 1, 2? 1 minus 1. Right? So the null space is the span of 1 minus 1. Any number times 1 minus 1. OK? Very good. All right, so that means 1 minus 1 multiplied by minus alpha squared plus 6 alpha, 2 alpha squared minus 6 alpha should equal 0. So there's your scalar condition of the perpendicularity. Now you can see that this would turn out to be a quadratic in alpha, and so then it determines alpha. So whereas at the zeroth order level, or the lowest uh, uh, level, we have an unknown value alpha. 
it gets determined by the Fred Holm alternative condition. So when you go to the next order, you get an expression that tells you which alpha to pick. And that'll be a generic um, feature as well. So whenever we want to find an unknown parameter at a problem, we'll go to the next order, impose a Fred Holm alternative condition, and find out what the parameter was. OK? This is minus 3 alpha squared plus 12 alpha equals 0, which has roots 0 and 4. OK, um, that's a good question. So when you solve a system of equations, whether you do it in terms of genus or particular or whatever, you have to make sure the right-hand side is, the, is in the right space. And that's all I'm asking at this level. So I haven't come to how to write the solution in homogeneous, particular, blah, blah, blah. That's a way that's easy to introduce uh, when you haven't done linear algebra. <laughs> and usually you see it in the context of differential equations. But even in differential equations, and we'll come to it, Fred Holm alternative applies. And it's always true. Right? You need it to apply, otherwise you can't solve a linear system. You don't have the right right-hand side. Um, it's an interesting question that will arise, and it's much more subtle in the case of differential equations, where we'll start, you know, you, you may recall concepts like variation of parameters, undetermined coefficients, all of those things we will maybe see in a completely different light. They will appear, but, yeah, I don't want to say more. It kind of spoils my punchline. Yeah. OK, uh, so the phrase closure problem usually refers to the fact that you can't get certain quantities in terms of lower order stuff. It's precisely the opposite to what's happening here. So this is not the closure problem. I am closing the problem, so to speak. OK, so uh, the closure problem is when you sort of are not able to determine it purely in terms of lower order stuff. So in the case of turbulence, the fluctuation cannot be written in terms of the mean. The mean is the lowest order solution. And the fluctuation, we can't write in terms of the mean. But here I've, I've basically allowed myself to close it in some sense. Now, it's not a solution because it's an approximate solution, and that's a slightly different issue. Okay? So I don't have a closure problem. Yes? Correct. You will get uh, possibilities from both, right? So there's, there's some combinatorial game you have to play. You know, the total sum has to be 2. You can get that as 2 plus 0, 0 plus 2, 1 plus 1, and 1 plus 1. Yes. But there'll always be one order less, because you've already got an epsilon. So it is 1 plus something should be a given order, and so necessarily this has to be less, right? <clears throat> okay, so this tells me that alpha is actually not undetermined. If you want to satisfy a nonlinear problem, alpha has to be picked uh, correctly. Okay, so let's disregard alpha equals zero. Because that's just a trivial solution, and I don't want to pick that one. Right, so let me choose another. Note, alpha is not the eigenvalue. Alpha is just a scalar quantity multiplying the eigenvector. Okay? So let's just disregard this and consider x10, x20 to be 4 times 2 minus 1. And I can now go to the next order. My ah, that's my equation. Everything should have a power of epsilon, so this would be x11, x21, and all of this will be in terms of 0, 0, which is, in some sense, actually this equation. I haven't solved this equation yet. I've just said that, oh, it can't be an arbitrary alpha. 
once I've picked the alpha, I can clearly solve for x11, x21. So let me write this becomes 1, 2, 1, 2, x1, 1, x2, 1, turns out to be negative 8, 8. Okay? First things first to notice, the right-hand side is in the range of the matrix. The right-hand side is a multiple of 1, 1, as it should be. In fact, that's what we made sure by picking alpha correctly. Any other choice of alpha would have led to a vector that has a component in another direction other than 1, 1. Then you can't solve that problem. The matrix always spits out something in the direction of 1, 1. So the right-hand side should be purely in the direction of 1, 1. If it has a component in another vector, you're dead. Okay? And that's precisely what this choice of alpha is guaranteeing, that this is a solvable problem. It's not too hard to see that then x11, x21 turns out to be, because I don't trust myself to even do this calculation, um, 8. Eight by five, one one. Okay. An easy way is to really just do this multiplication and sort of see well what combination of one one and two two will give me this. A more systematic way to do it is the following. So one one. 2, 2, let me just write this equation again, x11, x21 is negative 8, 8. Assume the unknown is perpendicular to, what was that vector? 2 minus 1. Okay? Why would I do this? This comes back to the point you were asking in terms of homogeneous and particular solutions. The solution to this problem will be one particular solution and an arbitrary multiple of the homogeneous solution. What is the homogeneous solution? Precisely 2 minus 1, the thing in the null space. And I'm saying I want to make sure there's nothing in the homogeneous direction. It's not an issue, like, so the Fred Home alternative only allows us the right condition to generate solutions. It doesn't pick a solution uniquely. You still have a null space and you can still add anything in the direction of the null space. So I can still add always some vector, some number times this vector to x1, uh, one, x2, one, and it'll still satisfy this equation. So now I'm assuming that my unknowns are not in the direction of two minus one. That's a reasonable thing to assume since x1, zero, x2, zero is in the direction of two minus one. So if there was something in the direction of 2 minus 1, put it here. Don't put it in the correction. So we will effectively assume higher corrections are perpendicular to the null space of A. This one. This is one one. Right? Uh, maybe I'm off by a minus. 
Sorry? Minus 8 by 3. Yeah, probably right. Okay. Um, the important point I want to make, A and A transpose both play a role. A transpose sets what the coefficient in front of the zeroth order term is. To get the first order correction, you need to say it's perpendicular to the null space of A. So both of them play a role. So the Fred Home alternative is based on the null space of A transpose, but to actually solve the problem uniquely, you need to impose a condition that the solution lies, or at least the corrections lie perpendicular to the null space of A. Right? So when we take this expansion, we will assume that I don't have to worry about the homogeneous part. I'm effectively saying the homogeneous part is zero. Because the homogeneous part is where, to use your phrase, the base solution. Right? That's what I want to keep. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah? Yes? Okay, very good question. Very good question. Uh, so is everyone okay with it up till now so that I can address that question? Uh, any more questions about what we've done so far? Is it all good? Ah, so if I have two interesting solutions, to use a non-mathematical phrase, right? So then follow two branches. Pretty much. Just follow two branches. So for each choice of alpha, you have a separate set of solutions. Possibly, possibly. So in, in some differential equation examples, we will have the lowest order equation be a wave equation, and then we'll have two possibilities, a rightward moving wave and a leftward moving wave, and then we can consider what happens only to the rightward moving wave, and then if you're a physicist, you might say, well, left and right should be basically the same, so the leftward one should also have the same equation. But you could conceive of problems which are not parity invariant, in which case you would actually have to do the calculation for each possible wave. For instance, suppose you had a system of wave equations. Now there's no such thing as a left and a right. There's directions, and they need, maybe they're spherically symmetric, but there's no parity obvious that you can exploit, in which case you have to follow each direction independently. And you may get different equations accordingly. Okay? Yeah. Yes. We've, we've exhausted our freedom. Yes. Yep. Yep, I'm going to do that. And that, that's going to address his question as well. Yeah, but we've lost our degrees of freedom. So we generate new degrees of freedom. So that's, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So um, let me, since, since two people have asked this question, let me actually proceed uh, to the next order. So let's just summarize what we know so far. X1 x2 should be 4 times 2 minus 1 minus 8 epsilon by, people claim it's three, uh, five, 3, but I claim it's 5. So just for consistency, I'm going to do this, but in the notes it's different. If I've made a mistake in the notes, let me know. So this is what we know so far. We know x1, 0, x2, 0, x1, 1, x2, 1, right? And suppose we wanted to go further. Whatever we do, we will end up with a situation of a non-invertible matrix acting on a vector equals a known quantity. That known quantity may not be in the right direction. We will have to impose a Fred Home alternative, no matter what. But the problem is we don't have a chip to play. We had an alpha before. We've exhausted the alpha. What are we going to do now? Okay. 
So whenever we have a non-invertible matrix, the Fred Holm alternative enforces a solvability condition. that fixes an unknown parameter. Right? of points that I do want to emphasize. I can go up to a higher order. I hope the logic is obvious. The only thing is calculations get tedious, and then you start using Mathematica or Maple or some such thing. Where, yeah, that you can't solve for an alpha? Well, that basically then says you you have a problem that makes no sense. <laughs> Right? And so then you, that problem doesn't have solutions, or at least solutions of this form. I'm never going to do for all epsilon, so I'll never reach that <laughs> in practice. Um, and usually what you do is, in terms of paper-pencil calculations, you're only interested in some generic form. This is kind of like what you would have done to do a expansion to get the waveforms, even in general relativity, you expand around the flat metric and you get the post-Newtonian correction. This is literally what we're doing. But I'm doing it in a much more baby example. And that's kind of my point, is that what you guys are doing in post-Newtonian expansions, what someone is doing in cold atoms, what someone else is doing in atmospheric science, is literally the same thing. They're all equations of the form LQ plus epsilon NQ for different complicated systems. Yeah. Um, do I go up next order? Huh. OK. So suppose I wanted to go to the next order. If I wanted to go to the next order, I want to see everything of order epsilon squares. So I'll have something that's an x12 and x22 and contributions which depend on both of these terms, right? Because I've got an upfront epsilon, and so I, can ha I want epsilon squares, so I can have an epsilon times an epsilon. So this term can also contribute, right? And of course, the structure of my nonlinearity was some of it was squares, some of it was linear, and so I can have all of those possibilities, right? Again, a computer algebra system will take care of those issues. That's not the point. The point is, you will end up with a system of some form of this same matrix times an unknown vector equals something. But now there's no alpha. Everything has been decided. So you can't impose a condition because you don't have, uh, you can't pay the price. Ah, that's right. So he sort of told you what to do, which is, we, our initial solution looked like alpha times 2 minus 1, and I took alpha to be a constant. And you're saying, expand alpha in a series of epsilon. And that's literally what we will always do. So to summarize, anything that was a constant, we are going to start taking them to be functions of epsilon. And then we'll proceed. So this sort of reads this sentence kind of backwards. This sentence says, in order to impose the... So the Fred Holm alternative fixes an unknown parameter. If you want to impose the Fred Holm alternative, introduce an unknown parameter so that you have the freedom. So when we took x1, x2 to be alpha 2 minus 1 plus epsilon x11, x21 plus so on, I'll take alpha to be alpha naught 
plus epsilon alpha 1 plus epsilon square alpha 2, and so on. Where at each order, I'll have an alpha to play with to fix through the Fred Home alternative. Yes. Yes. Precisely. That's that's exactly what I wanted to say. Yeah. And then track. Yeah. Yep. Yes. That's exactly right. Yes. Totally. Yep. Correct. That's right. So basically, this statement is where we have a choice. Is always free. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Is at least order epsilon because you'll go to higher order epsilon corrections. So these. Yeah, so basically I can think of this as alpha naught plus epsilon beta, uh, where beta is a function of alpha, or alpha naught, to be precise. Right? And so now I'm actually introducing a new function that I will get bit by bit. If you've ever implemented Newton's method, this is literally what Newton's method is doing. It's finding the correction in the right direction at each step and taking a st uh, one step in the right tangent plane and then making another correction and doing that iteration. Since we're doing it by hand, we'll stop after one, <laughs> but you can see how the logic could apply uh, to uh, a numerical method. And so in the case of this particular uh, polynomial equation, uh, you can actually prove that beta as a function of alpha naught is continuous, differentiable, blah, 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 and that you can actually find the function beta as a function of alpha naught. And you can write the solution as alpha times a vector times epsilon times another vector that is a function of alpha naught and beta. No, no, no. Up, well, this is the thing. This, is, this, only, this statement, as Amit pointed out, has to be only true up to order epsilon. So, so the correction to this guy is an order epsilon. That's why I have epsilon alpha 1. So if I expanded this alpha, this is alpha naught, right? So if instead I had an epsilon alpha 1, that would multiply the 2 minus 1 vector. And so it would be a correction at this order. So x11, x21 wouldn't be this, but it's actually plus order. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, 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 minus one, two. Correct, 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 correct. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. I don't, well, this is now true. <laughs> well, plus something. I haven't written it. Uh, I want eight-fifth there. I want minus eight-third, one, one, plus something. So then this does become minus eight-fifth, one, two, plus something. I don't know what that thing is because I didn't write it down. Yeah. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. So the important thing I want to emphasize is whenever you see a constant in a problem, that's a freedom you have. And you can make the constant a function and then fit that function to enforce the Fred Home alternative. That which is a constant, make it into a function. Choose the right function according to the Fred Home alternative. This is literally what you do when you do variation of parameters. When you solve second order differential equations using variation of parameters, that which was a constant, you turn into a function and then choose the right function to satisfy the particular solution. Right? That's, that's the whole idea of variation of parameters. And that's the idea of perturbation methods. Because perturbation methods reduces nonlinear equations to linear equations, <laughs> linear forced equations, and then obviously you will do variation of parameters. It's just that you're doing epsilon expansions 
because we don't know how to solve things exactly, so we solve things perturbatively. That's the only trick. So you, otherwise, we're doing precisely what you would have done in a first course in ODE. But I'm just sort of abstracting that idea and even doing it for polynomial equations because it's the same idea. Okay. Any questions about this? We're good. Anish, does that answer your question? Right. So, yeah. The the logic will always be we want to uh, sort of. Do things perturbatively, but the choices we make will all be enforced by this Fred Home alternative. Okay. Um, all right. I won't have time to uh, finish this, but let me just introduce the next problem. This is a canonical problem that you will do when you do perturbation methods. I think this is called the duffing oscillator. Um, so once again, claim this is of the form so Q is the function Y of T. L is the operator d squared by dt squared plus 1, and n of q is y cubed. Okay? And so, evidently, I can write it in the following form. So I just wrote it in, a, in the form of a system where the components x1, x2. So x1 is y of t, x2 is y prime of t. And the goal is to find x1 and x2 as functions of time. So the difference from the previous problem is now we've got derivatives, so we need to solve a differential equation, so we'll end up with functions of a parameter, but we still have the same structure, which is we have a linear differential equation, which we know how to solve, plus a nonlinear term. And so if we make an expansion, If we make an expansion, we'll get a linear differential equation, x1, 0, x2, 0, plus one, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, x1, 0, x2, 0. This is order 1, which has solutions. You all know how to find them. You basically can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix and write down what x1 and x2 should be as functions of time. These are complex eigenvalues, so you can do some combination and end up with sine t and cosine t's, or linear combinations of sines and cosines as a solution. Linear combinations where the constant up front is unknown and will get fixed when I go to the next order. So I'll write order epsilon, I'll do this next time. We'll get a contribution from here, and we'll end up with a Fred Holm alternative condition that we need to impose, and that'll fix how our parameter 
should change or what our parameter is. As it turns out, in this case, okay, let me back up a bit. Previously, to find alpha for our algebraic example, we ended up with a polynomial in alpha. So it should be no surprise that when I have an alpha here in a differential equation, I'll end up with a differential equation that alpha itself satisfies. So the goal usually will be that we'll have an approximate solution times you know, some function alpha, and alpha will be a function of t, and I'll find the differential equation that alpha will satisfy. Maybe that's an easy equation to solve, maybe that's a hard equation to solve, that's a separate question. But at least I know I can find the equation that alpha should satisfy, and then I can do some analysis there. Okay? So, once again, we have a linear operator, so we'll have some null space. It's very obvious that this operator has a null space. All of you already know how to solve these differential equations, so you're not surprised that it has a null space. And we need a null space, because if the operator is completely invertible, the only solution is zero. And so, you know, it's, it's one of these things where there's a lot of the connection that we saw previously in algebraic, in the algebraic example, will follow exactly through. The only difference is, what's our notion of perpendicularity? I will see what I have to do. <laughs> so, what you, so sort of, in the next lecture, you'll see that alpha doesn't change at time t. Alpha itself should actually change uh, on a time scale epsilon t. All of that intuition you have will be systematically obtained. So I will work under the assumption that we have no intuition whatsoever, and the Fred Home alternative will tell me what I need to do and, and how things should change, so that I don't muck up the calculation I've done up till now. And that's the logic, is that you want the series to be true up till what you have derived, and that which was a constant will depend on epsilon, and hence, derivative with respect to that will be higher order necessarily. Yes, yes. So automatically, I'm only going to be working in Hilbert spaces. Usually, I'll be working in the space of L2. Um, yeah. So what is the null space of this operator? It has a two-dimensional null space, cosine t and sine t. And I can ask to focus only on the cosine term, or I can ask to focus on the sine term. Those are two separate uh, null space directions. So you can have a perpendicularity condition with respect to the cosine term. You can have a perpendicularity condition with respect to the sine term. So we will actually have two equations that we get generically. And we'll, in, in this case, it'll finally turn out they're actually the same equation. But that's, that's a peculiarity of this problem. But in general, the dimension of the null space is how many compatibility conditions you need to enforce. Each compatibility condition will turn out to be a differential equation for a parameter. So alpha was a parameter, and we'll see that alpha satisfies a differential equation according to the Fred Home alternative. That in order to enforce the Fred Home alternative, it must satisfy a compatibility condition. Yeah. Yes? Will the? Good question. I just wrote down a differential equation without initial conditions at all. So um, this is uh, a point that I'll emphasize more when I talk about what I mean by orthogonality and how I define the inner product. Um, in, uh, in, in this case, uh, it'll turn out I'm interested in solutions that are periodic in time. And that'll be my initial conditions, which is actually turning it into a boundary value problem, not an initial value problem. So I'm interested in periodic solutions to this case, and so one set of periodic solutions here is certainly sine t and cosine t, and then I want to add a nonlinear correction, and then we'll see what that does to our problem. Um, 
Usually, again, in the literature, people don't tend to mention precisely what initial condition, what boundary condition, what are they actually trying to do, and I, I'll try to emphasize precisely those points. Yeah. Any other questions? Next lecture. Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll do that. So, uh, and in the notes, if you want to read it, go ahead and read the notes. I talk about how to solve these differential equations. So there's a section in the notes that says short detour on solving linear systems. I'll just assume all of you have read that, just how to solve linear differential constant coefficient systems. Okay. Uh, any, any other questions? All right, if not, I think it's lunchtime, so we should stop. <laughs>